Yeah, I think I think so this window always appears. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh hello everyone and welcome back to the gist seminar. section at the moment um uh, working with Steve Brewster um so uh Alessandro works um in, in uh audio virtual and augmented realities sonic interactions and evaluation of personalized experiences in augmented realities he got his master's degree in computer engineering and uh, degree in electronic music composition um and he was a research assistant at human at the human inspired uh, technology lab at the University of Padua he worked on various European projects, um, and uh, he's passionate about music and multimedia arts. Uh, when he's not researching, he's a singer and songwriter. So uh, I think I think this aligns nicely with the topic as yeah. well. So this is quite nice. Yeah, so great. So uh, looking forward to your presentation on sonic entanglement. Okay. So thank you. Uh, nice to have you here in such a large number. So I'm uh, just uh, ask you sorry for my English. English now because I, I know I'm here from still uh, for three months and I'm just learning so I don't have any opportunities to speak so just be patient and thank you for that. Anyway, uh, just something about uh, the, the summary of what I was talking, I, I'm going to talk uh, about today. Uh, well, I, I will focus uh, at first uh, on, on the main topic that is the effect that technology have on uh, our experience. So usually we we try to act on the technology to make it easy to use or something or make the, the technology do something for us. But uh, unfortunately, the technology can, can also have an effect on us. So that is that what I would like to, to talk to you uh, today. And then I will, uh, will deep dive a little bit uh, in, in a theoretical uh, background that is the sound uh, um, sonic interactions in virtual environment framework that I'm using for my research, and um, and then I will go deep in the practical some experiment I I did with the technology and that I'm doing with the more psychological part of the of of the research of audio and virtual realities, and then I will talk about some possible um, real concrete application in the field of uh, digital humanities on so museums, uh, the cultural sites, etc. So a little bit about me. Uh, that's me. I has um, uh, I have a, a very sparse background, a lot of different experience. Um, I had a degree in computer engineering in the late old, old, old many, many, many years ago, so in 2010. In Italy, then I worked in the psychological and human computer interaction uh, lab uh, there. Uh, then I quit with the academics. I started teaching in high school, not by chance, but I, I chose. So it's something to me very, that was very interesting and uh, something reflect a little bit also on my research. Uh, in the meantime, I did some uh, uh, open, tried to open some startups. Uh, one was uh, for uh, games for um, children in hospital, and the other one for uh, it was uh, uh, something like an audio guide that a museum can personalize. I didn't do any big money about that, so I I decided to come back to the to the academics. I did I did a degree in electronic music composition uh, just before COVID uh, comes in Italy, and then I started decided to start my PhD in University of Udine with in the topics of uh, virtual reality, audio sounds, uh, et cetera. So um, that is my, my background. And then I'm, I'm here in Glasgow. It's a wonderful city. People are very friendly, a lot of unexpected good food. So <laughs> yeah, really was really unexpected, but was also really good. So anyway, I'm here. Well, um, I would like to start with this topic. The technology, uh, we usually act on the technology, but also can the technology change us? There's a lot of statement about that. Something is uh, not rubbish, but 
not so good, not so clear, not so really helpful. For example, there was a, a, maybe some 10 years ago or something, some papers from Microsoft that said that we have the attention span of a goldfish. That was not really correct because it, it didn't took any uh, many, let's say, things in, into account. So it, it, it's something not really, really perfect as a study. Then there's some uh, books uh, uh, on how to manage technology, to, to make technology um, convincing for people and make the technology addictive to people. So there's something like that. There's, and then there are some interesting studies that are available, like the, this one from Mass Later, which I would talk a little bit later in the, in the talk. That is uh, about uh, the a virtual reality in where there is an agent that uh, can make you do things inside the room. So you are in a virtual environment, you have an agent and, and other people, virtual fake people, a person in front of you. The, the person tells you come here, but he, he comes towards you and you try to move ahead and with uh, by learning how the, the person interact with the virtual um, environment, let the people move backwards. And uh, in this study, Mel later and uh, uh, Yazun Castanis uh, try to demonstrate that uh, you can act on the uh, person behavior, on the user's behavior to do, uh, to make them, uh, to make uh, him or her do something in the real um, or virtual reality. Then, <clears throat> My topic is, um, as a wider um, perspective, is that one, but I am trying to focus on a very narrow field that is a virtual reality, but not uh, everything in virtual reality, but audio virtual realities. So I, I consider as a starting theoretical background, uh, virtual reality as a continuum. So we don't have the virtual realities, the augmented reality, at the real, the reality, let's say the real environment, but I I consider it as a continuum. So I can I can use some virtual elements inside the real environment, some real elements inside a, a, a virtual environment. So we can talk about the real environment, audio augmented reality, but also augmented virtuality. Let's say if we use the the AirPods, the, which is the the technology I usually use in Italy. It is this one? Maybe some some of you have a, a, a some similar device. You can put the this inside your ears and you see through the real environment. But it's not a real environment because they has a, they they have a microphone. They process something and they provide you something that is not real. Seems real, but it's not the real environment. So it it, it can be a, an augmented virtuality. Something similar happened with the Quest 3 that you see through the environment, but you don't see the real environment, but you see something through the, the, the camera. So you see a video that is, has a, a narrow um, point, field of view. For example, the colors are not the same. The perspective is not the same. The distance could not be perceived as the same. So that is the... The problem. So uh, I consider it as a continuum. I usually work in, in in this range, but it should be considered to me uh, as a continuum. The other thing that I will use a theoretical background is a, a, a framework that to me is useful to um, to explain that uh, that I, I can act on the technology, whatever technology it is. But also the technology can act on me, uh, changing my, my behavior, changing myself. Um, it can be a, a change that uh, can be permanent or not, but it, it doesn't matter. The technology can change myself, can make uh, me do something. So in this framework that is specific for sonic interaction in virtual environment, so it was developed my, by my supervisor, that is Michele Geronazzo in the uh, University of Udine, University of Padua now uh, in Italy, and uh, takes into account three different dimensions. The first is immersion, that is the degree to which the range of sensory channel is engaged by the virtual environment. So let's say 
how uh, to me the, the environment uh, seems real, how I feel immersed inside the virtual or real or augmented virtuality, etc. how I feel immersed in, inside the environment. Then I take into account the coherence, that is the plausibility of the rendering. So let's say how real the interaction seems to me. Some interactions can be real. For example, if I need to, to take some, uh, some spheres or something inside the virtual realities, that can be uh, the, some behaviors that I can also do in real environment. But if the real environment, uh, real and uh, sorry, the virtual environments uh, um, ask me to fly, for example, is something I will not do inside the virtual uh, the, in a in a real environment. So uh, the plausibility is something that seem uh, seems real, but it's not uh, necessarily real. And the most important dimension is the entanglement. So. Immersion and coherence works together to make a, a realistic environment in which I can act and in which I can interact and receive some feedbacks about the, the environment. And together we move and we change. I change the virtual environment and the virtual environment changes myself. So this is the theoretical background. I also developed a, a visualization instrument to maybe for design. That is a work that I would like to mention because it, uh, it will be published uh, hopefully this summer. So you have something to read uh, while you're sunbathing in the beach, etc. So hopefully. <laughs> anyway, we, I started from the uh, ant maps that is work from Latour. And uh, I, I, some, I do some modifications about that kind of, uh, of representation. We use the, the, the node and node colors to represent the actors. The answer is the actor network theory. And uh, in which, with the node, we can represent everything that comes into account by using the technology. So the users, the technology for, for example, the device, the earphones, the, the Quest 3, etc., but also the algorithms, the artificial intelligence uh, stuff, uh, everything should be represented as a node. You can have a, a different level of details inside the representations. So maybe you have the users, but inside the users, there are maybe the hands, the ears, uh, or something that it, is, it could be useful for, for your design. Then I can use the node color to represent different properties. For example, that is a, a virtual uh, element, uh, a, a real element, or something that is big, small, etc. So you can use different colors. No transparency to represent the coherence. So that should be something like how much can I control the specific actor? For example, I can move around the, the space. I have some tracking device. I can control the tracking device, but the, the tracking device has uh, some level of accuracy. So, my, so I can't uh, control perfectly the device. So. The, the node represented the, the tracking device uh, could have some little slight level of transparency. So I, I can represent something like that. Also the arcs and arc weights uh, can be used to represent the number of possible interactions. That is, can be a, a real number or something like a theoretical number. So much, many interactions, very few interactions, something like that. And the entanglement could be uh, can be represented by using the perspective and the distance. So, for example, this is this is the same system through time. When the system starts, can have this kind of uh, representation. For example, the AI engine is a, a little bit distant from the user. While using the system, the AI learns from the users. The users learn from the AI, and the system the representation errors. So, I can have some. Uh, representation through time, maybe also with a timeline or something. So it's a, an instrument that I am trying. I'm starting uh, to use uh, with my experiments. Seems to work, but of, of course, uh, you're welcome to, to make questions, to use. I can give you some, some information, more information about that. Anyway, about this kind of system, I think that person, personalization is not maybe the, the, the only element or, or the most important element, but can be one of the most important elements. So the personalization of system, we are uh, still talking about virtual realities, but the specific context of audio virtual realities. 
the personalization can uh, um, be personalization of technology. So for example, we can use a personalized function to specialize the sounds around for, by using the user's head dimensions, the, the user's special needs. Maybe someone can be better to the left ear or the right ear or something like that. Um, we can use different device for tracking. We can have some latency, et cetera. So the technological personalization that we can use. And there's also can be a personalization about the content. So we can, it depends on, for example, here I can use some different sounds about, um, let's say, photocopy machines, machinery, telephones, etc. If I'm outside, I can use uh, sounds about uh, birds, dogs barking, cycling, etc. And also I can take into account the user's preferences. For example, the sounds that uh, a, 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 a person can have in, in his own, his or her home country, for example, that can be different from the sounds that are available here, maybe in the background, in the environment. I can uh, personalize the content using different user's vocabulary. Maybe someone can speak a little better, a little worse, et cetera, uh, about, of course, the user's language, familiar and unfamiliar sounds, et cetera. So that, that's uh, the, the thing. And of course, I can use personalization by involving artificial intelligence, for example, for using users' feedback, users' habits, um, also related to, to the movement, the, the level of uh, movement of health, uh, sport, et cetera. And also the behavior, the, I can track the user's behavior and use all this data inside an artificial intelligence algorithm. Then some more cues about uh, binaural audio, then we have a, 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 context, a context. I could give you something about the, the personalization, the audio. And uh, when we deal with uh, audio virtual realities, we deal with binaural algorithm. Binaural is, a, a, let's say, a, a technique to play sounds into the real space. So for example, you can hear maybe when you, you hear at the mix at the pop song, the classical song, etc. Songs are recorded by using microphones. And then the mixing engineer to, to better, to, to clear, listen, clearly listen to, to sounds. It moves the sounds on the left, on the right. So that is, a, that is a stereo mixing. This is a little bit different because you, you use algorithm to perceive not on the left or on the right of the uh, side of the speakers, but you, you only can use the headphones and you hear the sounds perfectly inside the room. Commonly use, common use algorithm, use the uh, use uh, HRTF, that is a particular function that is dynamic, dynamically calculated and applied to the sound that uh, usually have some problem. The, the most important thing is the front back confusion. So if a sound uh, should be perceived and in front, sometimes you perceive it on the backward. You have a, a very ma a much problem about the sound elevation of the sound. So also, when you hear something around, uh, perceiving the elevation of the sound is, is a little bit difficult also with common sound, with, with vision and with real sounds. And uh, as well with HRT, HRTF, uh, um, there's something, some many problems about uh, perceiving the elevation. And the other thing is the head tracking. If you use this kind of microphone that is a head with two uh, fake ears and two microphones inside the ears, you record the sounds, but the sound is static. So if you move your head, the sound comes with you. Okay, so you can use the HRTF to move the sound. So, so the, the sound source is still in a point. You move the head and the, you, you, you still hear the sound in that direction. That helps in conveying the correct specialization of the sound. Why there are this problem? Mainly for two, two, two things. The first one is that uh, the human experience is multimodal. So if you hear to a sound, for example, a voice, a guy speaking, something like that, and you don't see the, the person in front of you, probably you, your brain will uh, think that the person is behind you. So you have maybe the front back confusion. Then usually the algorithm you use uh, uh, are, doesn't take into account the, the head, shoulders, etc. So you, if you move, it's like you're moving like that. 
Okay, so there's a problem in perceiving the elevation. I think that uh, the, the shoulders will help in perceiving the elevation. So this could be the problem. And the other thing that the HRTF usually are um, measured using this kind of uh, equipment that, that are dummy hand, uh, dummy head, sorry. And uh, if you look around you, you will spot that everyone has different ears, different head size, maybe some a little bit longer, a little bit larger, you say some strange uh, shapes, etc. cetera. So um, uh, HRTF should be um, carefully calibrated along your shapes, along your head dimensions, ear dimensions, maybe shoulder heights, and etc. cetera. So these are the problem. To avoid uh, many of this problem, it's not perfect, but it works a little better. I developed a, a framework, practical framework that uh, you can download from GitHub. If you need, I can give you the link. That is composed of uh, some different blocks. A part is virtual and then a part of course is real. So we, we modeled it around the corridor. A fancy corridor that we have in university in Italy are, are not as good, uh, as beautiful as this one. It's very ugly, then I'll show you. So you can you can find. Uh, it's composed of uh, four blocks plus the tracking. Okay, so I'll explain you a little bit uh, in more uh, detail. This is the corridor. So you've seen there's nothing really. Passing the days here is not uh, as good as... Uh, this beautiful shaped window that you have here. Anyway, um, the first part is uh, related to the reverb. The reverb gives the uh, speciality, so it'll um, uh, help in uh, perceiving the sound inside the space. So it's, uh, otherwise you will hear the sound like is in, specialized inside the room, but it's in something like in your head, you move the head is somewhere, but it, it's inside, is near you. So you can use the river to perceive a, a perfect uh, room, also the dimension of the room. For example, an example of this can be if, he, if I am working here, you are perceiving that there are some specific dimensions, some walls, etc. If we are inside the bathroom, for example, and we, we, we speak together, you probably will hear my voice is a, a little bit uh, boomy, very different. You, you hear that 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 uh, the room is different. Your uh, your brain you perceive this this kind of difference. The reverb help in do help uh, helps doing that. And uh, in uh, in my framework, I use the specific reverb that is the uh, uh, reverb that is the scattering delay reverb. That is something that is modeled around physics. So there are many kinds of reverb. This is modeled around physics. And uh, in, uh, with uh, this specific algorithm, I have the control of every direction. So I can speak, for example, toward that wall. The sounds will come toward me and also moves around all the other uh, walls. And I have the direct control, precise control of all these directions. <laughs> I can uh, model the dimension of the room and also the wall absorption coefficients. So the, for example, the, the decay time, et cetera. So what I've done, I took this uh, beautiful corridor. I used the, a, a phonometer to measure this, this measure that is the RT dirty. It's something like I do a clap inside the room. I have a microphone that records the decay time of the, of the sound. So, uh, at first it was something boomy and then it reduces during time. And I tried to match the, the decay time of the room, the real room with my virtual room. So everything seems uh, similar. Uh, okay, usually you can do this with a swipe, a sound that is like Whoo! something like that, that can help in uh, um, um, selecting and uh, dividing this, this, uh, the frequencies inside the room. So that is the first part. The second part is re related about the HRTF, this particular function that is um, head ray related transfer function. It is a dynamic function uh, that usually is measured uh, uh, with uh, uh, many, with a 
uh, a facility that costs a lot of money. So you, you need to have an anechoic room. You have to do a moving element with a lot of uh, uh, speakers here. You, you put the, the, the user sitting inside the room. This element moves with all the speakers. The, the user have two microphones inside the ears, nothing harmful. Everything is harmful, so there are no problem about the health of the, you put the one inside the ear. And, and then you measure the, some, uh, you, you put some, uh, uh, some impulses with the headphones, with, with, the, with the speakers, and you measure that kind of a function. So in this way, the, the function can be personalized. It's a difficult task. Where not many institutions have this kind of facility. So I developed, we developed with my supervisor and other people, we developed a method that used the user, three photos of the user. So a photo in front, a photo on the sides, and a photo of the year. And we calculated a, a personalized HRTF by using math. The first part, the low frequencies are modeled around a specific model that is the spherical model with your displacement. That is something like a filter, let's say. And the high, uh, high frequency part that is most dif more difficult to, to model is not, uh, uh, we don't use a, ma a math function but we use real uh, person, real people that are measured inside this facility. And there are some uh, database, we use the CPIC database available online with uh, the HRTF measures and also the all the head dimensions, your dimensions, speed, being, uh, shape, et cetera. So everything, we have a lot of metadata with, uh, with the HRTF. So we use the, the, the mathematical function for the low frequency and the real, the real uh, HRTF for high frequency, we match everything together, we mix it, and we split at one kilohertz, one kilohertz below is the spherical model, and, and, and then there are the, the CPIC uh, CPIC shape. So we, we, have, we do this kind of Frankenstein HRTF. That seems to work. We have uh, some works that tells us that uh, is, uh, is good in perceiving the direction, and also the elevation is better than, uh, than uh, let's say, the uh, standard HRTF. And this improves, of course, in the front back confusion, elevation, and also in the externalization of audio sources. The externalization is helped by the reverb we choose. Then the third part and fourth part, the, the other two blocks are the headphone calibration, because uh, every device, every, head, every speaker you use, have a different coloration about the sound. That is why, for example, if you watch a, a film on TV, sometimes you it's difficult to uh, understand the words. It's not you probably, but it's because uh, the mixing engineer and or mastering engineer didn't do the good work in uh, moving the the audio from the film uh, from the sorry from the cinema facilities to your to stereo speaker. Of the of the TVs, so we use the, a function to calibrate the the sounds that are coming from this kind of speaker, and the other part is the we calibrated carefully calibrated the volume of the audio sources, because we we know that the volume is the most important thing. So, if, for example, if I uh, if you listen to a, a pop song. Uh, it is well known that if you listen to two songs, the one that uh, sounds louder is the la is the one that you like the most. It's something usual and well known about the mixing and mastering engineer. So everyone tries to push the limit of the the the, the hate, the the perceived loudness. So we try to calibrate everything to seventy dB to seventy decibel because it, it's a measure that worked for us. So in our test, we use the noises. So there are not real, a noise is not a real sound. So we had, uh, we hadn't, there, there wasn't any, let's say standard level, reference level to that. Well, and uh, at the end, the last thing is that we used the, the consumer electronics because it has some, uh, some pros for us. 
the first one is that was unintrusive. So by going around inside rooms, environment with a, an iPad or a smartphone with the earphone is nothing unusual. If you cycle through Calvin Way with the bike and with the headset, you became famous uh, on Instagram because everyone's shooting at you. So and, uh, it's something really different uh, as, a, as a technology. So we decided to use that kind of technology and see if it can work for our, for our works. And uh, of course you have an intrusiveness, uh, high acceptability, and also is, is something easy to use. So maybe for example, museums or, or also institution, university can have many mobile phones, headphones, something that is easy to, to get. Uh, for example, we don't have any Quest 3 in Italy in my university, so I can't use the, this kind of technology. On the other hand, we have a lot of problems because uh, the first, uh, in, the most important thing is that, uh, for example, the iPad is a proprietary technology. Nobody knows how things work, it just works. You can uh, access the, you can't access the algorithms, you can't access uh, um, the precision, accuracy, you don't know anything about the, for example, I don't know if, if, if here there is an accelerometer, a gyroscope, everything, we don't know anything about the technology inside. And nobody knows, nobody wants to, want to tell anything about it. Also, you have problem with tracking accuracy because Quest 3 has uh, uh, some millimeters of a precision. So if you move, it, it tracks you in a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an accuracy of millimeters. That is something straightforward. And the other pr uh, problem is that uh, the, uh, is about the latency because it, this works with Bluetooth. So it has something like two, 200 milliseconds or something like that. Can, that can be a problem. We did some tests about the accuracy. And the accuracy, uh, the accuracy was not bad. It's not perfect, but it's not bad for our, so, so for what we're trying to do. And uh, we had the, uh, let's say something around the 10 centimeters, that to from 10 to 20 centimeters of uh, problems in accuracy. The test was done in, in the same beautiful corridor. We put some uh, uh, X inside on the on the floor. And we moved the, 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 the iPod in, in every dot that we, that we draw, in every X that we draw. And we put a fake head in front. And we, record, we recorded the position of, uh, the, of the, the trapped position of the iPod and of the head. And uh, in another condition, we also shaped the iPad in order to, to check if the, the tracking accuracy was good, but just uh, simply shaking with the hand. So something easy, easy and quick to do. And we did all, uh, some, some tests. We have uh, maybe some like, uh, this was uh, two meters by two meters. So some, some tracking, some tracking tests. And the, the accuracy was, was 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, something like that. Um, I don't remember. Ah, yeah, okay. Of course, we, we prefer this kind of technology over some other type of technology, also because of the, the this is unintrusive. For the unintrusiveness, I've already, so I've already said that this thing. So I think that now it's all. Yeah, is it? I, I, I've said everything. So also the latency. The latency was around 200 and 300 milliseconds. We did some informal tests with uh, some, some apps measured. Uh, so we don't have any proper test, but uh, usually this is the, the latency that can be a little bit too much for tracking, for, for movement tracking, but that's it. For the experiment I, I was going to, to explain you in a second, we used also a virtual and uh, a real environment, a, a real room that was that that corridor. We put a, a speaker on uh, in, around the middle of the room. We measured, of course, every every um, every dimension in, in order to match the the real and the virtual environments together. There was a speaker. There was the the user with the iPad in hand or or in the tripod and uh, the earphone, so the user can, could hear a, a, a sound from coming from the speaker. 
or the same sound coming from a virtual speaker behind the ear, be, behind the head of the user. We choose to, uh, to, to put all the sounds behind the user to avoid the front back confusion. So no visual part is involved in, in the experiment. And with this kind of setup, we did two technical tests. We talked uh, earlier about personalization. Now uh, I show you uh, two experiments about uh, the technology personalization, how the technology works, et cetera. And then I talk about a little bit uh, uh, about the content of the, of the personalization. The first experiment was, was about the perception of distance. With all this system, how tracking affects the uh, uh, perce perception of distances. So if you have a, a virtual source uh, three meters behind me and a real source three meters behind me, which is the different uh, perception? And we ask the user uh, by using nine different uh, conditions, nine different type of uh, personalization of tracking, how the distances uh, are perceived, uh, which is uh, the which um, uh, audio source has the same distance about the real source that they were using. And um, we used uh, uh, three different uh, head position tracking. The first one was with, uh, with use by using the front camera of the iPad. So he perceived the, the, the head of the user. We tracked the user through the iPad. So I have the, the, the iPad in hand. My position is the, 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 this position. And the other one was the iPad with a, little, with a little bit of displacement in order to that the position of the iPad seems more similar to, to the other one. This is the first experiment about the perception distance. The other experiment was the, uh, about plausibility. So, we used nine different conditions about the, the platform. So not, not only the tracking, but also the, we used the, the fully calibrated room. We used only the reverb, only the organization, only the HRTF, et cetera. We, there were uh, 36 different conditions, which is nine, uh, nine conditions in order to keep the, the, the experiment uh, small. And also this took something like 20 or 25 minutes. So. If we use the 36 condition, it, it took um, too much and was not reliable. So we used nine different conditions and we asked the user which sound, uh, virtual sound is most similar about the real sound. To do that, we used two different, uh, uh, two different experiments that, that I'm talking together about. Uh, to, to, it, was, uh, it was done in, in two different moments. So. In the first experiment, the one about the distance, we used a, a personalized uh, interface in, inside the iPad. That was a, a Mashra test. Mashra test is something to compare different uh, different audio sources. It's a standard test. We asked the user to, you, using the reference, to compare all the different conditions and eliminate the, the worst condition, then the second worst, etc. So. This is the test. The other test was about listening to different conditions. And uh, uh, in this uh, scale, to evaluate how similar is, for example, this sound is uh, the most, no, this is the most similar to the reference. The other one is uh, the second most similar, etc. So this is the other, the other um, let's say, interface. The height is not important. It's for just for a visual, for a visual help for the user. What comes out was that uh, the airports are not good for tracking, anyway. But uh, um, I can leave you the slides just to if you are interested uh, in which is the most interesting condition, etc. But uh, to me, the most important thing is that we we find out that. Uh, if you have the iPad in hand, the tracking with the iPad and, and the tracking with the, of the face are not so different. Okay, so probably because you when you use the iPad, you, you have a head and torso movement together. So if you move, if you if you track with the iPad, if you move and you move your head, 
the the sound doesn't change so you have to move everything like that okay so probably participant prefer conditions that avoid sensory motor mismatch and so this maintains uh, coherence between movements and virtual sound so something if you use a specific technology you move with that technology the user tends to prefer a, a movement that is coherent so we can say probably that technology that the technology influences how i move inside the virtual space so the users and the technology we use are entangled together probably so that is uh, um, comes in the direction of the framework of the dynamics so this is to me an interesting an interesting point and the other thing is that uh, if you do any experiment uh, about the, the virtual reality with audio, be careful and check in the volume because that is, uh, the, it is the most important thing. You can uh, equalize carefully the headphone, et cetera, but the volume is the most important thing. It's perceiving the correct, uh, the correct thing. The higher the volume, the more real seems the sound. It's strange, but this is the most important the most important thing that we are using also in other in other later experiments. And just about to conclude with uh, some other spot. Now I'm working on two different sites about uh, not much the technology, but the perception of sounds inside the virtual space. The first one is an experiment I will I'm conducting in Italy, in my home university, that is uh, a reproduction of this later uh, paper that I was looking in the first uh, in one of the first slides. So I have a user that's uh, in inside the corridor inside the room. I have a virtual agent behind me for to avoid visual cues, etc. The agent tells me, "Come here." So I should come uh, and and go to to the user, but uh, in the meantime. The agents want me to, to go to a specific target, a target that is in front of me. Okay, so by using a reinforcement learning algorithm, I am trying to uh, do the agent uh, some uh, movements in order to push the user to the specific target. So in, in, this, uh, in this way, I can demonstrate that the user and the system can work together to do a task. A task that, that, that can be, that uh, the user can know or that the user can know. So it can be a subliminal task, something like that. And uh, um, we, have, we did uh, some, uh, some subject, seems to work. So the, the whole system uses a specific psychological um, well-known effect that is the proxemics. So for example, if I use, uh, if I talk, to one of you really near yourself, you tend to move backwards, okay? And I'm trying to use this kind of effect inside the virtual environment and seems to work. So probably uh, the, the virtual environment and the real environment can, can work together and the real affect the virtual because I am moving and the system tracks my position and I can affect, uh, can be affected by the virtual environment. So the virtual environment can work on me by doing something that I don't want on, on my, or, or I'm not aware of. So that is the, the other experiment that I'm doing here in Glasgow. If you see some strange gowns, guys around in a Kelvin way doing some strange things with the bike, don't worry about the experiment later. <laughs> no, don't worry. If you want to join us, I'm still waiting for the ethics. So now, in someone inside the university can are interested in and can can join. So the the experiment wants to evaluate uh, the different the plausibility of sounds in uh, by doing different tasks. So I I, I ask the user do the participant do two different tasks. The one is uh, uh, the first one is uh, an audio related task that is an, a, a sound localization test. So for example, if the sound comes from there, I have to point inside the virtual reality 
uh, and ask uh, to localize sounds, so it's something audio related. And the other task is uh, cycling while listening to sounds. You have to cycle, but uh, some virtual sounds, fake sounds arrives. So I would like to test which is the uh, how the plausibility changes inside different conditions, inside different tasks, etc. So this is the other part of the experiment that I'm doing now. And this, these are more related about the, the, the previous one was related about artificial intelligence and interactions. This one is about the content, how the different kind of content and action acts on the user perception, etc. So this is the, the, the two experiments that, that I'm running in, in these days, in this month. The last thing I would like to show you is uh, uh, some possible application about the uh, audio virtual reality. So maybe it can be interesting, maybe it can be boring, this kind, this field, but uh, I think that uh, there are, uh, it's important to spot some uh, practical application about the work in order to, to, to know what to do, what, what are the direction of the work. And I, um, I did a review work that also is in publication. Uh, we, we are waiting for the proof of uh, publication, etc. That is a review about uh, audio virtual reality that involves storytelling for virtual muse muse um, sorry for museums, uh, virtual realities, etc. So in the field of cultural heritage. And at the end of the paper, there are four different uh, possible applications, future applications that uh, to me can be interesting to, to work on in the future. One is the emotional museum. So you have a museum that can be real, but also virtual. And by using sound and with audio virtual realities, you can uh, uh, develop emotions and uh, also convey not only the, the pictures, the sounds, etc., but also the emotion of a certain field, for example, if you walk uh, through a cultural heritage site, you can hear sounds or something like that it can be interesting. Also, you can do immersive analytics. For example, imagine you have a, a, a library of sounds, a library of works or musical pieces or something like that. You can move around the virtual reality and join, make research using sounds and using interaction inside inside the virtual world. Another one is the archaeoacoustics. So you have, for example, I, I wonder how much the, the, the environment would have influenced, for example, a speech. Let's say in, Ita in Italy, we had, uh, unfortunately, Benito Mussolini that uh, tells at a certain point to join the, war, the Second World War. How much the environment could have influenced in the perception of the speech of Benito Mussolini inside, for example, probably here you have something, something different, but could could be something interesting to me. And the other thing is uh, the universal fruition. Of, of course, is uh, uh, the last but not the least. Probably is the most important. Sounds is an uh, an important uh, um, a way of conveying information. So, for example, if you go inside the museum, you have a a, a picture and someone can, that can see well, or can see at all, etc. Sounds can be a, a very useful way to convey information, to, to do everything, to, to make um, the, the art accessible. So that is a, a possible and a most, probably the most interesting scenario of the of this work. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your attention. And uh, if you have some question, I will, I'm here. Uh, I have a yeah. Actually, about the project, like the one for the last where you guided people. Uh, this one. Okay. Yeah, so, so, is the idea is to guide them without them realizing, or is it like implicit? Or... Yeah. Is that we without realizing? So the 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 agent tells you come here, but he's behind you, so you tend to. To move back, you should move backwards. Uh, I see, I see. So but, because of the proximity to the avatar. Yeah, yeah. but he, he, the the agent have uh, uh, some different action that he can do. He can move backward one meters, two meters. Can uh, uh, can can be toward you. Can stand still and only say, "Come here," etc. 
So by using the, algor the algorithm, it tries to learn which, which is the best uh, um, action to do in order to push you. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, that's very interesting because it's, it, it, uh, I think it overlaps with a lot of activities in other domains like uh, human drug protection action and yeah. human drug action. Uh, there's a lot of studies on like how far the people distance themselves from drugs. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, drugs. yeah. yeah. Uh, and also a couple of years back, there was a study on uh, uh, like guiding people to stand in front of situated displays. And what they did is that they would distort the screen okay. so that it would be so annoying that you try to position yourself <laughs> in a way to okay. see it clearly and, and it, it unblurs as you approach the correct position. Ah, okay. So you okay. could explore also like using this approach to um, to guide people into different things within the environment or or well it can distorting be the voice or the, the audio and then making it like as if you know you it's improving as you approach the, you know, the... the yeah, uh, well, at first, there are a lot of uh, studies about that uh, in the visual domain. Mm -hmm. So with uh, the, the study I was relying on uh, was a study by Slater of uh, 2012. So it was uh, a little bit old now, uh, but it was all made in the virtual reality with visual. The visual is much stronger than audio and there worked uh, very well. So the effect in audio, I suppose, will be a little bit uh, softer, but still should be. I I just made some preliminary evaluation. There is an effect about the the pushing, and uh, mm -hmm. the the study you were, you were talking about are in uh, explicit study. Let's say you the the user is aware. I would like to uh, check if the uh, if the user is is unaware of that. So. Uh, of course, uh, this can be in the future a problem because you have the technology that uh, uh, implicitly tells you what to do and you're not aware. But to me, it's important to, to show that there is this problem so maybe we can correct in the future. I found this guiding thing really interesting. I don't know if you mentioned this when I mixed it, but did you get a sense of how either individually consistent or generally consistent, the kind of this herding <laughs> action is like you know how consistently if you play you know the sound from a certain location mm -hmm. will they move a certain distance a certain direction because i was thinking about it for navigation but i was like if yeah. there's a lot of noise you don't want to navigate you know somebody who might have visual impairments you know into the road yeah but if you, but if you had a consistent if it was both consistent for individuals then you could actually simply use it to kind of guide people more implicitly that way yeah in fact it, it was also my thought because the the first uh the first idea was to 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 use an audio guide that implicitly brings you to a route inside the museum for example with the picture you like or the picture that are less visited in order to make you new something new etc and we 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 are trying to to make to control this effect huh? mm -hmm. and know how is how this effect is strong and make it and make it stronger. But it also, I think, depends on the technology. So if the technology is better, the better is the te technology, the better is the effect. So that is the, the problem. So maybe in the future we can we can reach something interesting. So the navigation thing I'm my memory serves me correctly. I'm pretty sure Steve and Dr. Anderson did something about GPS based navigation, mm -hmm. the radio type effects applied to the music you're listening to, so you know whether you're on the right path or you're deviating from your path, just as a slight comment. Um, so, kind of similar thing that can get you to manipulate your position and uh, direction based yeah. on the music you're listening to. Um, a slightly different question would be so, some of your work is kind of auditory. AR based. Well, where where do you see audio AR going in the near future? You know, we're we kind of a lot of our work is predicated on the idea of we'll have these magic augmented reality yeah. glasses in the future with slam tracking built in, but the display is quite costly. It's quite battery intensive, and you know if you had audio effects yeah. based on six dot tracking with AR glasses, you know, how how do you imagine our our soundscape is going to change the reality. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the historically, audio is not considered much inside the technology. So everything goes in the, the direction of video, but uh, only maybe 10% of the budget, 5% of the budget goes inside the audio. 
to me is an interesting technology because uh, is uh, usually an intrusive and can be something that uh, if the we have a very high definition devices then the companies have nothing to do more more to do with the vision probably they will try to do something different with audio for except uh, for example also apple after doing the retina display, much bigger display, fancy colors, etc., now he's focusing on audio division. So probably something that uh, will come after video, but uh, something to consider and take into account because it can be something different from the the, the usual path. I think there's probably a chance for audio to be a kind of first class citizen. Maybe we are in the future because the, the optics is really hard. Mm -hmm. It's very intensive. It's computationally intensive. Yeah. It's a mobile form factor. I mean, it's restricted field of view. It's actually the visual bit. It's yeah. a bit crap and has all kinds of problems. For, yeah. You know, everyday AR in the future. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm wondering if maybe there's an opportunity for the audio the kind of primary modality. Yeah, this is, this is what I hope. So, <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's, the audio is the thing I like and also or maybe to me is, is something promising, so. And let me think, there's I think someone online. The other one? Uh, no? Chandra. Ah, there's a, ah, okay, sorry. So we say the chat messages. No, here. Or, I mean, if I, someone is online, they can unmute and ask a question. Yeah. Let's see if there's something. No, nothing nothing interesting. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, yeah, let's thank Alessandra again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you're still with us for a couple of weeks? Or? Yeah, I live on the 25th. So, okay. All right. So, next time we have some of them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's uh, in office, so we're one for one? Uh, one. one for one, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I in uh, in my review work uh, we we found uh, really nothing interesting because uh, there was about the technology they. I feel like it's been super. The stagnant. Obviously, we've all been to museums where, like, you might go to like a diorama and yeah. play like some audio from a speaker of yeah. like you know people working in a blacksmith. Yeah, 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 yeah. But in terms of taking that to the next point beyond just putting some speakers in the environment, I feel like it hasn't changed much in about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> because also usually the the museum guys are not so technical. Yeah, so yeah. they don't know what. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Making a website is something yeah, exactly. very difficult yeah. for them. So I will pass it to you. I have access to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Sure. So I will... See you later. Thanks. Hi. Sorry for nothing. The sound is Ah, uh, in the yeah, because that's going to be very yeah. so. But I was wondering like when you like you should have like a digital twin. Yeah, yeah. Are you just basically once you create the room, you just the So. Oh, I uh, the river do all the stuff. So because you have the, the room models, yeah. you have to measure the room for yeah. the, 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 the framework. You measure the room, and uh, then inside the river, that's also the, all the algorithms that is physics based. So yeah. it's not an input graph yeah. of something that is measured by Microsoft. Yeah. It uses formulas. Okay. And uh, that, yeah, I can. If you write me, okay. I can. Uh, well, I don't know if there is uh, an email, but you can find maybe on LinkedIn. You can write me. It's probably okay. it's an easy way. I can give you the link of uh, of the software. Okay. I have I have a second question because I can't find a definitive answer. So basically, I'm trying to do as a small part, but like kind of like your agent thing. But I have a robot, right? Yeah, it's got two speakers on the side. Yeah. 
Um, and then depending how far away you're from it, you can actually throw the bowling ball. Yeah, not rocket science. But there's one paper on it in the bottom. It assumes down the attenuation of the six thousand miles of the bottom of the system. Yeah, which is depending on the room. And also, the speakers are inside the house. You can't really consider them point source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not the actual characteristics. But the other thing, see when you're measuring, like, because, like, obviously, you've got. Yeah. Yeah. How do you get over yeah. the inverse? Yeah. What, what's the rule for the inverse square law falling off once you get really close? Uh, well, um, unfortunately, there are formulas that are not too precise. So you have to rely on the because uh, you are the, the formulas that you usually use are for the outdoor environment. Yeah. So, for example, if you need to do the experiment about the, the season. And it's not a problem for you to do the experiment outdoor. Yeah, that's fine. Then go out. Then go outdoor. Otherwise, you have to carefully uh, check the effect of the lever because if you have, for example, this wall, yeah, you have an, an absorption of the wall. Point. Yeah, right. So, but like, so when you calibrate speed for yeah, yeah, or yeah, it's, yeah. it's reported that yeah. you might measure it five. When you're doing headphones, yeah, you're doing it very. I, I show very you. Small. I have the the photo here. I used. No, that's not this one. Uh, here we go. This is the the system. Yeah. So I have the speaker yeah a fake here that uh, you can find it when they do piercing something like that with the hole you put the microphone inside yeah then here you can play play back the the source with all the stuff so with the reverb etc you position it in, in the in the precise uh, point in yeah. For a room, and you measure with this, uh, with this kind of equipment. What if you want to? So that's measured at very close, right? yeah. Like, yeah, you measure very close, but the sound source can be at three meters, for example. Yeah, yeah, so you have to check when, the, you, when you're doing with an actual speaker, yeah, you wouldn't measure that close, yeah, yeah, but it, uh, like yeah. With, with like a like a, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, but you you have to assume the speaker as a point. Okay. For example, here you measure, you put the the virtual audio source at three meters inside the virtual room. Yeah. And the same measure you you can do the same measure with the virtual speak with the real speaker. You move three meters away. Yeah. Okay. And you should measure also in different position inside the room because probably if you move the speaker, etc. So this can be but can your can your software basically know what it, well I I can model in the sense that I, you have the possibility to if the sound is static, for example, in, in a specific room, huh? you have the formulas to to calculate the the correct volume based on the distance. But as a starting point, you you can calibrate the, for yeah. example, at three meters. Uh, I think what I'm trying to say is, if we have a conversation yeah. and you, you measure it at a point. Yeah, especially because they're they're going this way. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. they're going everywhere. Yeah, 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 they are genuine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Small, yeah. Right? yeah. When you get really close, yeah, it's not gonna. It doesn't follow like a. Yeah, it doesn't follow, but you have also the river that models all yeah. the, the the so it, it should be realistic. Okay. Yeah. So you can. Forgive it for being because you measure it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, you you have to do some assumptions. Also, I can tell you that the reverb sounds a little bit metallic because uh, usually um, we use the mainly the impulse response. So I don't know if you are into audio or you know a lot more. No, I don't know, but. In, in the impulse response is measured like, for example, you are in a cathedral, you yeah. do something yeah, yeah. like that, you record, etc. You look at the, look at the graph. Yeah, yeah, you look at the graph, etc. So you you, you do the, 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 I don't know, determining, but you do some math and yeah. you, you get the, the reverb. Here is, uh, you have the sound source, for example, in a specific direction. Yeah. You talk, I mean, like, I need to and the, the system yeah. calculate yeah. the yeah. the sound coming through the wall and coming back yeah. with a correct uh, delay that is some milliseconds, yeah. etc. Yeah. And the 
the sound behind, etc. At every reflection, you also add the HRDF, so you can specialize the sounds around. But you don't specialize only the sound; you specialize also the reverb. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Okay. So it, it should be. It's not perfect, but should work a little bit. Okay. Okay. Cool. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Like Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. No, she. He, I'm he's very. Okay. He's the unfortunate. Uh, I, I have a question. You have yeah. like a different project with the uh, audio, but it makes me think about bats trying to locate themselves yeah. using sounds that coming back from the like feedback sonars. Yeah. Like okay. did you consider incorporating the, stuff like that? Well, the the sonar is the effect uh, that one like the ambulance that yeah. is moving. That's what I the software does don't consider because uh, I'm working in in an indoor small uh, okay. environment because they like in an opera environment like in a, in a museum that's yeah a, I mean, that a big museum you want to guide people to yeah. go to a specific well, yeah. or whatever it yeah. can help them relocate themselves they feel like a vibration or they're holding something yeah like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It, well if that, it's interesting well, you, like, yeah yeah thanks <laughs> well it depends because if so you're working you outdoor like, for example is a little bit uh, like, it's impossible it's, yeah it's, it's possible, possible to model the reverse on, only for yeah, yeah yeah so okay. like in a big uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah also yeah. so yeah. thanks for the suggestion yeah. maybe we can oh, no it just uh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, we are done. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh thanks. You want to join us and then we go for coffee? Uh, you can close the. Uh,